All right, you're welcome along to Wednesday Night Rugby. I'm delighted to be joined by Liam Toland. How are you keeping, Liam? Good as gold, Nathan. Good as gold. Good. We haven't spoken in a while. I think the last time we spoke to you was about three and a half months ago when we were trying to plan our coverage of Champions Cup quarterfinals and maybe trips to Toulouse to watch Toulouse against Ulster and things like that. Jeez, it seems like a world away now. The, the glamour end of, of the business, Nathan. Uh, you never <laughs> rang, you never called, you never, you, gave me, you shut me out of your life, man. Yeah, the, the reason we didn't call, actually, the reason we didn't call is because we thought you might be busy because we knew you were involved in the healthcare sector and we didn't want to be hassling you and hiring you and particularly at probably one of the most important times of your career. Can you, can you talk to us a bit about that and away from the rugby, the non-rugby lean toll and what you do with yourself now? Yeah, well, I, I suppose I'm a retired army officer, so in a sense, I'm an old age pensioner um, and uh, retired from rugby, obviously, as well. But uh, 12 years ago, I handed in my sword and I opened up a, a franchise business called Home Instead Senior Care. So essentially, uh, people like us, our parents, our grandparents, want to stay at home. And they're struggling for some reason. They're vulnerable for some reason. And we've got caregivers. Uh, our team goes in to go into their homes. And sometimes it's one visit a week. Sometimes it's two or three a day. Right. Uh, and it allows that person or that couple or that family to remain living at home um, uh, much longer than they may have may have felt and also helps the families because because like the modern ireland you either live near your parents or you emigrated or sorry the old ireland but the modern ireland is we've got an awful lot of families who are just that bit too far away from mum and dad to be able to drop in daily so by by our presence uh, coming in allows the son and the daughter who might be in dublin when their parents are in limerick or in ennis um to have to, to relax that there there is there is a, a good scaffolding around the ability to stay at home and of course now with the COVID, like there's never been a more important time to be involved in home care in some shape or form. So it's been challenging, uh, really, really challenging. But it's also um, it's been really interesting to see the can-do attitude of the whole. Like the HSE, for example, get obviously they get an awful lot of negative press. But in my eyes, what they've done in my area has been really, really impressive. Like the real can-do attitude. We've been working together pretty much daily. My CHO senior manager has been involved. Uh, the disability section have been involved. We have a lot of conference calls. And it's been a pretty positive side to see the can-do attitude. Not without its flaws, but an overwhelmingly positive team effort, I would say. You then are very much involved in the care of the over-70s, of the cocooners, of that vulnerable group who night after night for the last 100 days we've heard mentioned on the television that we have to protect. And your staff then are very much on the front line. Being responsible for that and being responsible for that community how how stressful was that? How, how much pressure did you find when, particularly those opening few weeks where we were sort of heading into the unknown? Yeah, I remember when I started uh, 12 years ago, we had no caregivers and no clients, and that has evolved over time. But the good news is that we built a great team as well. So I have four nurses in my team. I have someone looking after finance. I have someone looking after scheduling. And then the caregivers themselves, the people who are going in the door houses. We were being led immediately by the, the public health messaging and I won't lie, at times I was overwhelmed by the amount of memos and information and the two meter distance versus this distance, the face masks versus no face masks. And it was overwhelming. And for me, that was one of the greatest challenges was to try and understand, OK, at the end of, of my chain is an 82 year old lady who's living alone, desperately needs our visit. How can we ensure that the caregiver going into that home is doing so? Uh, is protecting themselves initially, but also protecting the vulnerable older adults. So that's where PPE comes in. And again, we've worked really well with the HSE, who've been brilliant in supporting us. We've obviously got our own sources as well. Um, so I think in the beginning, Nathan, it was it was a definite the old army adage: hurry up and wait. There was this kind of tsunami coming our way through Europe, North Italy, towards us. And we weren't 100% sure. So we spent an awful lot of time throughout the network that is home instead, uh, within our own area, within our own HSE area talking to as many people to get an understanding, uh, linking up with the nursing homes because they've had their unique set of challenges to see could we support them in that journey as well, um, and ultimately trying to prepare as much. Now, the good news is that the evidence is still overwhelming, and it's been very heartening to hear a lot of our leaders, uh, political leaders, reflecting on the importance of the community-based care in the home care um, and reminding us how important it is. So an awful lot of preparation. We have had a number of caregivers who have, have been tested and we've had a number of clients that have been tested as well. But the numbers are very, very small, which is very helpful. And all the PPE, et cetera, all that, all that helps as well. So um, you can imagine 
where we might have one caregiver who might have, say, three or four families mm. in a very disjointed kind of patchwork quilt. If that male or female caregiver is sick, well, then that sets up a chain of events. So the logistics around it is, is always the most challenging part of it too. But again, the overwhelming can-do attitude of the caregivers and also of the team. Uh, and a number of families, because of the furloughing, uh, we have a number of sons and daughters for the first time actually have had an opportunity to go back to their mum or their dad's house. And there's been uh, interesting successes and failures in that. <laughs> there's been, a, there, there's been a, an interesting starting point and say, listen, wow, we can go back home for mum. And then they realize after a period of time, maybe like a son who comes back from, say, Waterford or Dublin comes home, and maybe the daughter is living next door and they share this. And then they realize for the first time that going into mum every day, even if it's only for half an hour, has a huge emotional challenge, a huge uh, physical challenge and, and, and stressful challenge to my sister. And they will now see the sister or the carer or the community that's involved in care in a totally different light. It is not easy being a carer. It's not easy going in, if you're a loved one, going into your mum or dad, particularly where there's like a dementia. It's not an easy journey. So in that sense, it's been good that many more family members are seeing that, really seeing that. Um, some relish it and others really would like to get back to their, their, their normal way of life. Of course, yeah. You talk about the clients there and as you say, if you're talking about elderly cocooners who are probably out of their rhythm anyways and they are sitting down watching the television every night and the news is getting worse and worse and they're literally fearful and maybe rightly for their lives. For your staff then, is, is it a different type of role they have to take on during a crisis like this? Because I guess families can't just drop in. The grandkids can't drop in for half an hour. They're totally out of their rhythm and the routine. Did you get a sense of of the stress that your clients were under as opposed to just normal times? Absolutely, like my parents, my dad is 85, my mum is 83. They are in the category of who we're talking about. They have had it, they have and continue to have a very meaningful, engaged life. And that's the key, Nathan, is I have a 30,000 more thesis on this, so I won't burden you with it all, but that simply successful aging is linked to engagement in life. Now, engagement is watching sport, playing cards, going for a walk, uh, pruning your rose plant, whatever it is you do that engages you. And the great threat of COVID has, because of the cocooning, has limited our older adults' ability to stay engaged. So my parents were playing bridge three days a week. That's finished. Mm. My, my siblings, I don't have any, uh, any family, but my siblings have kids and they were in and out of the house. That's engagement. That's also restricted. Going down to the local shop, I mean, our local uh, Val, our local shop down in, uh, just down in Clonara, down in Emma Griffin's garage, like he's brilliant. That ability to have that casual conversation once or twice a day is gone. So when you erode all those things away, you really, yes, my mum and dad and so many others are very much alive, which is hugely important, but their way of living has changed dramatically. And there's an enormous stress now with older adults who've lost a little bit of independence, mm. lost a little bit of this engagement. And I think it's really important in the aftermath of this that we encourage in an appropriate way all those people back out to re-engage. Now then there's people who clearly have far greater needs, people with cognitive challenges like dementia, physical challenges, and needs personal care support, etc. Now they're obviously people, clients that the HZ and us have prioritized. We have, you know, in terms of hands-on. But we've other clients where we simply go up and knock on the door. How are you doing? Do the little bit of shopping, that interconnection, just looking for, and that's really, really important too. But I think the overall message is that being at home has been positive, has been challenging, but it's being able to stay in your community and stay engaged is the key to successful aging, and COVID is an enormous threat to all of that. Yeah, and it's a threat that it feels like is not going away anytime soon, and even as the country starts to reopen, the messages for the over 70s and for anybody in a vulnerable group is to stay at home as much as possible. And these have been a long three months for people stuck in their houses. It could be another year, 18 months, God knows when, if there's a vaccine or there's some return to normality. So you're obviously front and center in this. How do you address this chat? How do you see you can address that challenge that the over 70s can have a meaningful life, not just a life safe away from COVID, but as you say, an engaging life as well? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a two-way street, Nathan. Obviously, we can, for a start, society typically frames our older adults as a negative. So bed blockers is because old people. The housing problem is because old people. Like, why is this old man living in his house when a young married couple should be in that house? 
Well, that's insane logic. It should be seen as a huge success that society allows us to get to 85 or 95 or 100. This should be deemed a success. This is like, what a great country to live in. You can actually live till 100. And you will, when you're vulnerable, you will have a uh, support structure there too. Um, but media typically frame the older adult in a negative. And I think it's time to change that. I think it's time to align that with it's successful aging's greatest threat isn't that you can't do something, is that you haven't the opportunity. So we see in the Paralympics, people running around a racetrack with no legs because they've got the blades on. Mm. In essence, the blades give them the opportunity to stay as elite athletes. But our older adults, in a way, need that type of logic to support them, to allow them to stay engaged. And for some, it's a taxi service. For some, it's the local shopkeeper. For some, it's the bridge club. But behind that wall is also the determination of the person as they age to keep conscious that you can't just flick a switch when you get to 90. You have to start engaging in that. And I'll give you a little example, right? So my parents, in the mid-80s, as I said, so um, the cocooning thing, let's not get bogged down in the exact date, but my dad said, look, we'd love to go to, to Killaloo, which is 10 miles away from where they live in Clonlara. And I said, Dad, I think that could be technically a little bit, maybe it could be borderline. So if you do get stopped, make sure you have a, a legitimate reason for what you're doing, because somebody will ask you, you see. So he was stopped and the guard said, listen, uh, you know, looking into the car with these two people and this is what are you doing? And my dad said, listen, I have got this, uh, I have this um, ailment that requires me to have fresh air near the water. <laughs> 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 and the guard was like, um, that makes no sense to me, but <laughs> carry on. <laughs> or something to that effect. Yes. Right? But what it shows to me is my folks determination to keep going the determination to keep having some exercise. Like they didn't get out of the car. They didn't engage in anyone. They didn't, like, they brought a little picnic with them. So it was all very, you know, it was very, there was no dangers in it. Mm. But at the same time, the determination, their determination to go at their pace, to keep going out the door and going for a walk. They go to my local rugby club all present. Like, you know, it's, it's like any rugby club around the country. They go out and they go for the walk around the perimeter. They don't really see anybody. But they look forward to that every day, like. If, if you tell them you can't go, that is going to have a huge. So, yes, we as a society need to create these opportunities, which cost money, but we need to create them. But the person as well needs to be able to engage in them and want have the willingness to engage. And when those two things meet, you have a very good chance the society will win all over the place because of it. Mm. You're uh, as always been a great communicator, and you've spoken brilliantly there as an advocate for the elderly. And it's something you often don't hear from younger people. I, I'm, I'm listening to you wondering, is there, is there a greater role for you in all this that actually you, like it is your line of work, you have such knowledge both personally and through your career that we need more voices like you actually making those points you've just made. Yeah, and, and like, I, I suppose I, I had 12 years experience of, of being in the journey, but I also did my, my thesis in, um, uh, i give you the title, that's all i give you. It's, uh, does the, does the um, older adult, adult child communication model give aging the best chance of success, right? So it's framed in a concept of success. So what is successful aging? Now, for you, Nathan, you'll have your version, but you're equally as entitled to that question and answer when you're 90 as you are today. It's irrelevant what age you are. It's all about setting goals and all that. And I don't mean like end the McNulty kind of win an Olympic medal type goals. Mm. Appropriate goals to the... And then aligning them to the key thing, like there's three pillars. There's, there's um, uh, high mental and physical functionality. Okay, can you get in the car? Can you go up and down the stairs? Low risk of disease, like the Parkinson's, like the dementia and that. So they're two important ones. But for me, the most important one is engagement in life. Are you engaged? When you open your eyes in the morning, and the, like we have many clients that when they open the eyes in the morning to the, to the carer who's there, there's an immediate smile. There's a beginning of a day. There's a, and it's wonderful. If I could film it, which you can't, but if I could film it, it's wonderful. Um, so that sense of engagement in life is hugely important. And as I said, the great risk is not that you can't go to Pullman Park because you can't walk. But to, I keep telling people, Pullman, the best seats in the house in Pullman Park are the wheelchair access seats. The best seats. And if you happen to be with someone in a wheelchair, you get to be with them as well. Mm -hmm. Like on European Cup Day, that's the best seat to have. Hence, Tom and Park have thought out and said, listen, hang on, we want to give more people an opportunity to attend this fixture. And in Old Trafford, they have a blind people section. I was yep. there. Like, it's it's for not, like, what an opportunity. Why not include people who want to be there but 
for some reason can't be there and, and, and fix that problem. So I suppose that's kind of what we're, we're trying to do in a sense. And it's, it's been heartwarming to see through the COVID the realization that there's a huge value in this, but there's a cost to it too. Someone has to pay for all this. And I think it's money well spent. You probably have barely had time to think over the last three months. It's been so busy. Have, have you missed your routine? Have you missed rugby? Have you missed going to matches, working in rugby? Is, is that a, a piece of your life that you're longing to get back? I won't lie to you, Nathan. I have weaned myself off a lot of my... After me giving you a speech about engagement in life, <laughs> I, I've detached from one part of it and re-engaged in another. Right. So I do keep listening to Off the Ball, but not as regularly as uh, I have done. I, I listen to... I flirt with Lyric FM a little bit as well. I'm engaging in a number of different, different, different platforms. But I think from a healthy point of view, um, I'm cycling with a mate of mine uh, probably four evenings or four days a week. So this evening, I hope to get out. And for those who, who might be familiar with Limerick, if you go up past Thoman Park, so where I'm living, I go up down Henry Street. Initially, my cycling was down Henry Street, around Sarsfield Bridge, back across the New Bridge and up home, which is exactly two kilometres. And as the restrictions opened up, we went. But now we're going out beyond Thoman Park, um, out beyond Ballinanti. We swing left at Ballinanti, up through Ballinanti, up over Woodcock Hill, which is a 25 minutes, not at Duez, but it's my version of yeah, I was going to say, it might as well be. Right? And we, it's head down, head down, head down. And then we get to the top of Woodcock Hill. And it's all down in hill into Six Mile Bridge and into Cratland. And we stop in Six Mile Bridge every evening. And we have a cup of tea and a, and a Twix. We're like two old fellas, right? But you've earned it. Like, you've burned the whole way down. And then all the way into Cratlow, back in the Ennis Road and into Limerick and home. And it's about, a, I don't know, two hours. Of, it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. I've definitely lost weight. It's a great use of time. It's fresh air. The weather's been brilliant. It's great to see all the bike shops in Limerick are run, sold out. And it's just fantastic to see it. Uh, the only problem I have is uh, when you take off the, um, the bike gear, you're left with this Greco-Roman uh, wrestling kind of thing <laughs> on. And if you're not careful, you, you will look like a, an overweight Greco-Roman wrestler. And uh, that's a sight you don't Put want to... Put my hands up for that one. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Uh, I'm laughing out of that. Um, got out to my folks a lot, um, which is, which you know, is, is obviously part of the course. And my parents got a new dog today, which is uh, dogs and bikes are sold out. You cannot get a dog, you cannot get a bike, and that's two positives, I suppose, from COVID that society is engaged in these two wonderful things. Mm, it's interesting you talk about taking up a, a new interest and uh, how suddenly you can fill your evenings even in the void that maybe rugby once was in. And we're doing a series at the moment with Keith Wood, a State of the Union series about various aspects of rugby. And it's come up a couple of times about the importance of the volunteer in rugby, particularly at underage level, and a worry that clubs have that as we are this week, as things are opening up and sport is coming back, that an awful lot of the people who dedicated their lives to their club have realised you know what, having my two or three evenings a week where I might have spent three or four hours on the club to myself to go cycling, to go running, to actually spend more time with my family and my kids is a really good thing to do. It's a really rewarding thing to do. And that that may impact clubs and the volunteer sector that's so important in every aspect of Irish life. You talk about Old Crescent there. Is that something you could see happening over the next six months to a year? Well, you mentioned a short time ago, you mentioned the 100 days of this COVID journey. I remember Dr. Liam Hennessy explained to me once upon a time when I was, uh, he was trying to convince me that muscle has a memory and deep inside my lower body shape many years ago, he was suggesting the muscle is still there. And he said, it takes three weeks to make a habit and three weeks to break a habit. So that's six weeks. If you want to change your habit, six weeks. The danger for COVID is we've gone way beyond the six weeks. So there's a fair chance society has engaged in a whole new way of living and realize that, yes, that this is a really cool way of doing it, and this is a really good way of, 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 of living. And there is a danger that volunteerism could dip because of that, because of all the time that that takes up. I'm hopeful, though, that as society opens to again, that the concept, come back to the engagement in life, being with people, being with your community, is still the core of the GAA. It's still the core of soccer clubs, still the core of rugby clubs. You know, but one of the things I was trying to do when I came back to Old Crescent from Dublin, um, was redefine, well, what is success for all present? And in many ways, it is a group of like-minded people who happen to share one key core interest, which in this case is rugby. And in doing so, some are the ticket secretary, some play, some is the president, someone else. 
and that's the function of the communities. And I really hope that we get back to that point of view. I know Old Crescent again is is in tip top uh, uh, form. It should be having the pig importer, the famous pig importer, which has obviously been cancelled, which is a huge negative, obviously in terms mm. of fundraising. And that's a story for all clubs around the place. But I, I really do hope that as much and all as people love their families, they don't love them that much after COVID that they're willing to turn their back on their other family, which is in our case rugby. Speaking of Old Crescent, just before we came on, you were talking about watching the Black Lives Matter movement and we've obviously been looking closer to home a lot over the last couple of weeks and how we integrate the new communities into Ireland. And you mentioned that at Old Crescent, actually, you're having a lot of success with that. Yeah, I, I, I think most of this is by accident as opposed to design, to be fair, Nathan. But like, uh, I came back and my brother's four boys are playing rugby. So they've... Uh, uh, Killian, who's the oldest now, was 19. He was 13 at the time, so I went and joined, went and I were helping out. And immediately I was struck with the difference that all present in, this is in 2010, whatever it was, that when I when I started my journey all present, it was 1984 or something. Now in that window, the kids who were playing under 13s versus when I was in are very different. It's a complete tapestry of society that exists. And one of the things that I think there are a few certainly has to reflect on is the history in the past. And uh, Jerry Thorne had a piece in the paper during the week on that matter. Um, but one of the other things that we need to reflect is in this moment in time, clubs like Old Crescent have engaged in a community that have no background in our sport. Like we have kids, I mean, uh, we've got black kids playing, we've got uh, European kids, we've got Asian kids playing. But to see the smile and the happiness of people, kids who have no background in the sport. now. Sometimes the parents of those kids don't understand the sport. Mm. They've no background. Sometimes we as coaches have to go around to the houses and collect the kids, encourage them to keep playing. And I think there's a story, a positive story there that's well worth reflecting on. That our little club, and when we play like Ennis, when we play, you know, Gary Owen, Young Monsters, and we go out to the county, Newcastle West, etc., Nina, like we're seeing that across the section. So the, the community that is engaging in our sport has blossomed across a spectrum that's way different from when I started the journey. I think that's well worth reflecting on. And it's not worth patting ourselves on the back and congratulating, but it is a positive story for kids. And certainly in, in my experience, some of those kids, because their parents aren't necessarily from that sport, may not necessarily be encouraging it. Um, and we've got coaches go around and collect that. So their kids, like I, I was saying to my brother not so long ago, like these kids, no matter where they go after school, they have a passport for the world. Like they, this kid whose parents come from Africa, he was born in Ireland, you know, might find himself in Sydney in 12 years time. He can rock up to Randwick and say, how are you doing? I'm from Old Crescent in Limerick. I play rugby. Can I join your club? Like that's an extraordinary, mm. like for me as a coach, if I call myself that, that's a pretty cool outcome, I think. That attitude that you have, and I, I, I find it interesting because it often does come up about what a club should be and what success for a club should be. And it's too easy, even more so maybe in rugby than in soccer, probably similar in the GEA, to get wrapped up in individuals and having a player play for Munster or having a player play for Ireland. And that's success. How many players have you got in the Munster Academy? Well, that was a great team because five of them went on. But actually, one of them ended up making it. Four of them don't play rugby anymore. <laughs> Is that is that in is is it your experience since you've gone back to the club that that is an attitude that's shared by a lot of people that success is actually a lifetime connection to the community that is there through what they've learned at the club, or is there a, are there still too many people who are focused on individual success and if we have the one genius that that'll do us? I, I think I think because of the advent of the professionalism, the provincial game. That the clubs found themselves in the doldrums. Like I, ha I happily played in the early nineties, and I was in a club called Old Crescent, as I've been saying. But we were competing. It's like the the Porter Diamond. We were competing with. Uh, it was like some car manufacturer competing in Germany with BMW and Mercedes. We were always being beaten. But then when we went to the All Ireland game, we discovered actually we're, we're probably maybe the fifth team in the country. Or six just happened. The other four are in Limerick. Yeah. You know, we got so it had us reframe. But then the professional game came in. And all of a sudden, um, clubs kind of tried to figure out how can we stay relevant. And then the IRFU ranking structure of international, provincial, and um, club, that kind of got a little bit watered down and diluted in the importance. And I think one of the messages when I came back from Dublin, and I'm not so sure I 
sold it well, actually. I think it sold it badly, actually. But I was trying to get this idea of redefining what success is. It doesn't have to be your senior team. It could be, for example, if 70% of your senior team are homegrown, that's success. Jeez, that's an amazing success. Or maybe 60%. It doesn't mean that if, if that allows you then to still draft in the odd player, but that, but that means your underage structures are functioning. That means that you've created a loyalty in your underage, that when those kids have an opportunity to go to Dublin and so, yeah, some of them will, and some of them will play a professional game, some of them will, but all things being equal, that nucleus of players will stay. It's very GEA-like, but I think professionalism in rugby pushed a different kind of a need. And I think certainly Old Crescent is, is going back to that idea of, of the community, the sense of community, who lives around the ground, who's, who, who are in those houses, why aren't they helping? And that goes back to my point around the kids that come from different communities. Getting the parents of those communities into the club is as important as the senior team winning some trophy, mm. to me. And I remember we did a workshop in the club, and uh, I was kind of, this is where I think my sales pitch didn't work out, but I was waxing on. And uh, an old bloke from the club, we remain nameless, stood up and said, you know what we need now? We need to get 60 grand together and get a coach in New Zealand into coach the senior team, and that's what we need. And I was trying to argue, that's exactly what we don't need, actually, because I think there's way more prizes available within our own resources that we don't have to go doing that. Now, if we end up in the second division or third division or first division, so be it. But wouldn't it be extra special like the guys from Munster who won the, the, the Heineken Cup in 2006, to do so with so many homegrown players was even more special than winning it, having maybe travelled to Europe to some fancy team. It does sound, from what you're saying, that Old Crescent is doing a lot in terms of integrating those new communities. But the other challenge is the one you just touched on, that so those children who are there now, you hope they stick with the club, and in 15, 20 years, that will be their community, and it will be a perfectly normal thing. It's the parents who are here now and are probably wary and a right to be wary considering the way a lot of Irish society has treated them since they arrived at the country to give them the community, to say, actually, there is a community here that will welcome you, that will embrace you, and to get that message across. And it, it does seem as though within communities in Ireland that where there is the effort, where there is the will, that there's still a little gap in, in getting that message that please come in, there will be open arms here for you. Yeah, and it is. And again, I'm speaking about Old Crescent, but really what I'm saying is about the clubs in Limerick because there's huge similarities, obviously. I'm obviously more familiar with Old Crescent, but there's, we're not doing anything uniquely different, I don't think. Um, but again, I would say if, if, you, if a club establishes what is success, in other words, designs the five or six things, yes, the senior club being, the senior team being successful. But for me, if you have um, 14, 15 rugby teams playing for your club, and if you have two coaches for each, and that's 28 coaches, if 26 of them have a coaching course done, that's success. Or if 28 of them have a coaching course, that's success, as opposed to, to 10. And the other 12, 20 don't know what they're doing. You know? mm. And, and that, getting all of those things in together. And then I, one of the things I was trying to encourage is it should then be compulsory almost, not quite. That's sort of like a dictatorial state. But it, it can almost be compulsory that, for example, recognizing the communities that we have. So, okay, who comes from Africa? Let's have an African day here. Let's have a, a day on the Sunday where there's a blitz and it's got an African theme. Let's welcome people into our, our fold. Let's have a city theme. Let's have an, an engage in the community. And think of it not just centered on the senior team, that this is an entire community of people that we can engage who have a wonderful backstory to that. Like I employ a huge amount of different people from all over and I am all the better for it. Like, I mean, a hundred times the better for it. And um, that's what I would see in a club replicating, in a sense. Um, and are you preaching that the converted when you're talking about all the different levels there from having coaches who've gone through the right processes so that they're getting the right messages to the kids, to having different communities, that it's not all about the senior team being successful? Are people buying into that? Or is there still that old school attitude of, but what you're talking about, we're not going to get the benefits for years. Whereas if we, if we put the 60 quid into the coach, geez, we could be partying for the next three or four years. Yeah, now just by way of kind of framing it, I'm not on the committee like, so I'm not like the junior vice president stuff. So these are conversations I would be having with people. Um, and, uh, I'm probably talking myself into an honorary position now or something, but <laughs> um, I just think that it, it, it's certainly an opportunity. And I think, Certainly, all present. Like if you look and talk to the senior players, very few of who I know, but their entire 
motivation has shifted in the last five or six years. It's not about how much do I get paid if I play. It's, in, it's about, but where are we touring next year? Right? right. Just ask some stater. But it's a, it's a massive sea change. Like I toured the world because of rugby. I've been very lucky in the professional teams, but also in, in, in my amateur teams. And it's just an amazing, amazing, like I, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, the 2006 uh, Monster game. Like that day is the best day of my rugby life. And I explained to you. We were at Lansdowne. We went to flew to Buenos Aires. We played a match there. We got a boat across the River Plate to Montevideo on the Friday evening. And as any touring rugby club, we, we, uh, we had a late night. We got up Saturday morning, which is the day of the Munster Beeritz game. We uh, got up at whatever time it was on, and it was like 8 o'clock kickoff local time. So we were destroyed from two hours sleep, and we watched that. Then we got a bus across the town to uh, a rugby club called Old Christians, which is an Irish connection. And the president, I forget his name, but he's a red-headed guy, came out. He could have just walked off an island off the west coast of Ireland. <laughs> this guy, right? We played all Christians. At halftime, I was coached. At halftime, I went out to the referee and said, listen, unless you stop the eye gouging, we're gonna have to, I'm going to have to pull the game. It was old school rugby. After the match, we, we had a barbecue, your classic big, massive barbecue. It was amazing. Huge grilled meat, and oh, I was fantastic. And then at the very end, a guy called Roberto Canetza stood up and said, how are you doing? My name is Roberto Canetza. And I was a 19-year-old medical student. I was on an airplane. And we crashed into the Andes. And he told the story of Alive. Wow. So I'm standing there. That's the fella from, right? So he told his story. He explained that they were on a rugby tour. He explained they crashed in the, into the Andes. He explained the whole story around the, the, the people who, who had been killed immediately or those who were dying over time. He explained that he put pieces of flesh in his pockets that he took from his fallen colleagues. He explained how him and two other guys marched off the mountain, not knowing how far either way they're going. One of them turned back because couldn't go any further. So two of them kept going. He was one of the two. Eventually, after a couple of days, bumped into some, uh, some farmer and they rescued the whole thing. Now, that all happened on that one day, like, right? And rugby has given me that experience. And it's just a phenomenal. I suppose when I'm coaching under 13s, I'm hopeful that these kids will get something like that somewhere along the line. And our sport is unique in many ways because of the touring aspect of it. Um, but I suppose trying to get back to that world, and if the senior teams succeed, well, isn't that a bonus? But if all the other teams between it experience something like that, that's even better again. It's uh, been a Wednesday night rugby with a bit of a difference, Liam. It's been fascinating talking to you and listening to you. And geez, you're good at talking about the back row. You're even better talking about the other stuff. <laughs> the actual important stuff. I wasn't so good at playing in the back row. <laughs> Liam, uh, mind yourself. Hopefully we'll be back talking rugby at some stage over the next few weeks. Take it easy. Super. Thanks a lot.